So hello, everybody. Welcome to the first of the FloatCon webinars. Um, hopefully, everybody can hear me okay and see me okay. We're so glad that y'all are here. Um, it looks like some people are still joining us, so I will go ahead and talk really slowly as I introduce our speaker, Kim. Um, most of you probably already know Kim. She is our the president of the board of directors for the Float Conference right now. She's also co-owner of Sukino Float Center in Salt Cave, as well as the founder and creator, creative director for Mindful Solutions. Um, the Mindful Solutions' sole purpose is to help people who help people. Um, so Kim's background before joining us in the float world um, is 18 years of training in, and marketing experience. Um, and as we all know, Kim is passionate about helping individuals and business owners create a ripple effect on the world. Um, Y'all know her, we all love her, and we're so excited for Kim to give us a presentation about creating um, <clears throat> a culture where employees want to stay. So Kim, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Jocelyn, thank you. So glad you guys are here with us tonight. Um, and this is such a fun thing for me because it's where like my old world and everything I learned um, in the past comes in handy to be able to share um, with small businesses and more specifically with the folks who are in the same world that I am and care so deeply about the same things that I do. So um, a little more about kind of my background and my history. I, uh, as Jocelyn said, I did a lot with training and marketing. And the biggest piece that my team really focused on was always on creating culture. And if you think about it, that's what marketing is. That's what training employees is all about. It's about creating a sense of culture and a sense of belonging. So um, I'm going to share my screen in just a second. I just want to go through some tips and, you know, a couple of big concepts, but then I'll also talk about a few tangible ideas that you can implement at your center. So when we think about uh, creating a place where people want to stay, that really begins with your onboarding process. It takes a lot of time. It takes a ton of intention. And so it even starts before onboarding. It starts in your hiring process itself. One of the things that we found great success with at Sukino, um, I shared with at the float conference, and that's part of part of what I'm sharing tonight is based on some of the talk that I gave at the float conference. So some of you will see a few little uh, pieces here and there that look familiar. But one of the things that we do in all of our job listings when we're hiring for someone new is to share a video. The video is here is what a typical day looks like to come and work with us at Sukino. You can actually find that if you uh, go to YouTube, you can see our full video. It's only a couple of minutes long, but it gives them an expectation very clear of what to expect. And there's no question, you know, we put in there, of course, you can you can read that you have to be able to lift 50 pounds, but what does that really mean? We put it in a video and show a character carrying a 50 pound bag of salt. Um, we show you what it looks like to be cleaning showers repeatedly every day. Um, we show you that we're also taking care of people and that they may have some emotional experiences coming out of the float tank. And so that video really kind of sets the stage for what to expect, what a day looks like, and it's only a couple of minutes long. But that helps to kind of self-select out some of the people who may not be interested in that particular type of work. It's really hard to get to know what to expect from a job just from a piece of paper in a job listing. So yes, you still need your job description, you still need the, you know, the documentation on things, but having a video is pretty amazing. It's also nice that our, our guests get to see a little bit of the behind the scenes of what we're offering, what we're doing, and how we run things when you know they're not there, um, or when they are there, but they just don't see us running back and forth, getting things clean, and trying to create this really intentional environment for all of our guests to come in. You want to let them know if their typical day is going to be front of house, you know, where you are working on the computer, you're answering the phones, um, Maybe they're just focused on back of the house where there's going to be just a lot of cleaning that they might have to squat into, you know, small places. They might need to know a little bit about plumbing. They might need to know um, whatever it is that you're putting in the job description. Try to give them some visuals around what that's going to look like. Um, if it is kind of split or if they're going to be working alone and they're kind of juggling the whole thing, let them know that right up front. Very clear expectations. And have a plan, you know, give them an idea right up front 
of when you expect that they're going to be productive on their own. When should they be proficient? And there's a huge difference between productivity and proficiency. You know, productivity is when can they actually work on their own? When can they do something on their own? Proficiency is when you expect them to really be masters of that process, that they don't necessarily have to ask you every time it comes up. They should understand um, the overall process and they should be able to answer any questions that guests are coming in with or if something goes wrong and they need to troubleshoot. They're proficient if they can really do that completely on their own. Um, on the screen, I'm showing just a sample timeline. This is, I would not say is an accurate timeline whatsoever, but this is a kind of a, a glimpse at how you can set up a little bit of a plan. Like what is it you're going to cover? When are you going to cover it with them? And then what's coming next? So you can kind of set that expectation that, you know what, I think you're going to be on your own in about three weeks. That's what we're going to shoot for. If you're not ready yet, we may extend that. Or if you feel really comfortable with the whole process, it might not take that long, but really lay it out for them so that they feel like they know where they're going and when they're going to be able to really perform without you. It's also really important to let them know how they can be heard. How can they share feedback with you? Um, are you encouraging ideas during that whole process when they're really, they're coming in with fresh eyes and they might be seeing things that you don't see. So let them know up front, like, Hey, we just changed this process and we would love your input. Or if you're doing this and it doesn't feel right, or you have an idea on a better way we can do it, let me know, drop in a suggestion box, email it to such and such, whatever the process is for them to be heard, let them know how they can be heard. One of the biggest things you can do to create a sense of loyalty within your team is to empower them. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to empower someone. Um, so really understanding each person is going to help, but asking them specifically for their input. A few of the things that we do um, for our team is, you know, we don't want them to feel like they're just that cog in a machine that they're just here. And if something goes wrong with them, they are out and we put somebody else in their place. We ask them specifically, you know, if we're making, uh, if we're closing for the holidays or, you know, if my husband and I are going on vacation and we're not there to cover the other shifts, then we ask them, like, would you like to work on this day? We can close the center on this particular day. Or if it's a case where we need to be open for a half day, do you want to work the morning or do you want to work the afternoon? Do you want to work the evening shifts? You know, those simple, simple questions can really make someone feel valued and make them feel like they're part of something so much bigger than just showing up, clocking in, you know, cleaning float tanks every day. Um, that, that particular piece is, is just such an important thing. The same thing if you're making changes, whether it's a change to how long the turn times are between your sessions, whether um, you're suddenly going to be adding more services, Anytime if you're making changes to procedures, those sorts of things, ask them for their input. Hey, we're thinking we need to change something here. Here's what's not working. What ideas do you have about how we can make this smoother, make this work better? Also looking at um, what to do, empower them to make decisions. And that also means that they know where to go if they have questions for things. So you have a documented policy and procedure. If you're using Helm, all of that is super easy with the click of a button. Um, if you have, you know, any other places where you're keeping notes about um, whether it's your policies, your procedures, your checklists, all of that, make sure that they know where to find that and where to go for any kind of questions. If you're not there and something comes up, is it okay for them to text you? Should they call you? Can they chat you? Um, are you available during certain hours or do you shut off your phone? Be really clear about what the expectation is for you to be able to help them if, if you're not at the center. Is it okay for them to do whatever feels right? You might kind of have a blanket policy that generally speaking, we, we want to do this in this situation, but you can also say, you know what? If you feel like we need to comp a service, do it. If you feel like this person is just fishing for something and you don't feel like it's the right answer to give them this thing, then make sure you're having those really clear conversations and telling them what they can make a decision on and what they can't, and that you're going to back them up in whatever it is that they decide to do. Another important thing is to really pay attention to what stresses them out. Ask them, like, how's it going? Do you feel like you have enough time to accomplish what needs to be done at the beginning of the day before opening or at the end of the day? Um, a, a recent example at our center, 
we have people who love to hang out and have hot tea or will take forever in the ready room at the end of the day. And in those cases, it can be really stressful. Um, you think you're supposed to be leaving, you know, your schedule until say 9.15 and people are still at the center at 9.30 and you can't finish closing everything down. Noticing that somebody gets stressed out about that particular situation can be a really easy fix. So this happened recently at our center and I just created a little sign and the sign says something along uh, the lines of, in order to promote a healthy work-life balance for our team, this area, the lounge or the ready room, closes at X time. We appreciate your understanding and helping us to create a stress-free work environment so we can create the same for you. And that one little bitty thing shows how much you care about what the employee is experiencing, but it's also modeling setting clear boundaries for your guests and your customers because they need to practice that in their own lives. And that's something that many of us are preaching to people is like, how can you set these clear boundaries and, and not overwork yourself to find balance in all of your commitments and things? So this is just one of those little bitty things that you can do to let your, your team know how much you care about them and that you want them to be successful in their roles as well. It's not just that they're there to serve whatever you're saying. But something really, really simple and understanding what stresses them out can make a huge difference in their loyalty for you. Also really getting to know them about what their strengths are. You may have some people who are great at social media. Maybe you have someone who's really creative or uses TikTok or Reels or is great at stories or something of that nature. And you can you know, give them some piece of the social media efforts that you have. Maybe you've got somebody who has great connections in the community and they can do local outreach, you know, partnerships with local businesses. You might have someone who loves to be a part of trade shows and big events and they want to set up a table at some of those. Um, you could have somebody who's really great at managing retail. They'll do your inventory. They'll do your procurement. They can set all your pricing. They're responsible set for setting up all of the shelving. Those sorts of things, that's a job that you can give to someone and let them do something that they enjoy. Again, beyond just the basic job description, it's kind of helping them to feel like they're part of something. Maybe you've got somebody who's great at administrative things and they love to create schedules for the team or they want to, um, I don't know, improve on a checklist that you created or uh, they found a way to do something in a different way. Asking them, like, what do you want to do? What can I give you to be responsible for? All right. Another big thing is to celebrate the differences between your team members. Um, the best way to celebrate the differences is to really get to know them outside of work if possible. You know, what do they enjoy doing? Go have coffee, uh, go to a bookstore, see what kind of books that they are drawn to. Uh, what, what sorts of things do they do with their free time? That might be something that benefits you and your business, but it might not be. Um, but it's just, again, getting to know them on a personal level. Another really huge thing in getting to know your team is understanding what motivates them. So there's generally the stick versus the carrot. Hopefully you, some of you all have heard this description before, but it's the essential idea of punishment versus rewards. And when I think about things like point systems, for some people that is going to help keep them motivated. For some people, that's going to feel like a punishment. Like if they show up late, then, you know, they lose points. Or um, if they get a perfect record and they get a reward, you know, there's, there's different ways um, to manage some of your programs and it's going to impact each employee differently. So understanding that and still being able to kind of create a system that works for everybody. But if they have, um, you know, you could approach it that if they have five um, experiences of being late, then they're terminated versus if you have a month of perfect attendance without being late, then you get a reward. And so there's a little bit of a difference between how you approach things. Your goal is still the same. You want people to be there on time, but are you looking at it from the stick or the carrot? Are you going after them and punishing them if they do something wrong? Or are you rewarding them um, for the right behavior? Along similar lines is also understanding intrinsic, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. 
Some people are going to be rewarded by the fact that they get to show up every day and care for the people who are coming out of the float tanks. Some people just love being there and holding space for others. Some people are going to be rewarded by a bigger paycheck, by bonuses, by commissions, by public acknowledgement and recognition, maybe employee of the month. And the thing is, you might have a strong preference, but that doesn't mean that your employees do. And it also doesn't mean that they're wrong to be motivated by any of these things. Um, sometimes money is like such a touchy thing, but honestly, like that's why we work, right? We, we all do this for some sort of a compensation so we can pay our bills and provide for our families. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you can set the example as a leader for your team and say, you know what, it helps me to know what motivates you. Um, some people are super embarrassed by recognition. And so, you know, giving them a shout out on, on social media might just terrify them, horrify them, and they don't want that kind of recognition. But if you slide them a bonus check, they're going to be pretty happy. So understanding each person and what motivates them can really help to create that culture and that loyalty. Um, expressing gratitude is just one of the most basic things you can do. I say, like, thank them early, thank them often, um, but in a sincere way. If you are constantly saying it just as a catchphrase, um, people know that. They become really aware of whenever you're just throwing it out there. Some gratitude might be a word here or there. Gratitude might be a small gift, um, leaving, you know, tea, like uh, a special kind of tea that you received. It could be like if you're trying out a new product at the center and you got some samples, it could be giving those samples to your team and saying, here, you know, thought you guys might enjoy this. Let me know what you think about it. Um, it could be putting up a flyer that introduces your team. It could be a social media shout out. It could be something where, you know, once a week, you're just highlighting that particular person and maybe it's tied to your service. Like what is it, what's their favorite thing about floating or what's their favorite service that you offer? Maybe it's not. It could just simply be, this is such and such and we're so grateful that they're a part of the team. Another really small thing that you can do is to add their name to your signature lines on all of your emails. Any automated emails that you have going out, try to put the names of the people who work there. It brings that human element to your team. And rather than just including the owner's names or, you know, in our case, the Sukino team, put in the names of every person who works there. If you have 20 or 30, that might be a little bit much. And so that might be a little bit more appropriate to put in and the rest of the team or the whole team or something like that. But um, just putting those little bitty things to acknowledge that they're part of it and that it, it's the kind of a subconscious message that if they leave, then you do have some work to do to, you can't just replace them very easily. It's going to take a little time to get somebody else in there. And then you have to go update your email signature. Big thing. All right. Another big piece is to remember the fact Boop, there we go. Hopefully that wasn't showing. Remember the fact that there's a lot to forget. Um, you have been doing this for much longer than they have. Even if you are just opening your center, you've been studying float therapy. You've been studying what it means to run a, a float center or a small business in general. And there's so much that goes into it. And so when you're learning something new, there's this idea of the forgetting curve. So whenever you learn it, you really know a lot about what you're saying or what about you've just learned. But if you don't actually implement and use that, what you just learned is going to start dropping very rapidly. Within 24 hours, you will forget most of it. And then it's going to continue to drop day after day after day after day. So as owners, remember that just because you covered something in training with them on the first week or the second week, whenever that case, you know, it might be, if they're not using that information, they're probably going to forget it. Maybe on day four, you showed them how to change the filters and they never had that experience of having to do that until, you know, month three. And they're probably not going to remember that. So let them know again, where to find the resources, where is the documented procedure on how to do that, or who do they ask if they forget that. And then you can also space out the learning. So reinforcing, and if you can just kind of dabble a little bit, 
If you've heard me talk before, you've probably heard some of this information that I've shared in several other topics. And what I'm doing is modeling exactly what I recommend, that I'm giving you these ideas, I'm giving you these little pieces that you can use, and then you probably are all gung-ho about it. And then three or four weeks later, you've totally forgotten. If it's been a year, you've definitely forgotten if you haven't implemented it. And so just kind of that repeat exposure of dropping in these little clues, these little hints, it is okay to repeat yourself. And it is okay to be really clear about what it means to be productive versus proficient versus mastery. Productive means you can do it. You can do some of it. Proficiency means you can do pretty much all of it. You know where to find answers if you need if you need them. And then mastery is the fact that you are the one who's kind of creating the process and the, the, um, the overall flow for things that you are the one answering questions for other people. So understand that it's okay if people forget things. That doesn't mean that you should be frustrated with them and make sure that they know it's okay to ask questions. If you see that people are constantly coming to you saying, I'm so sorry to ask this, or I know you told me this once, but I forgot, like make sure that they feel okay with that. That way they can come to you for answers when they need it. And that you're also saying, here's what I would do or asking the question, how would you handle it? What would you do in this situation? What feels right to you? Again, that's helping, to, helping them to feel empowered. So that's a whole lot of information um, in a very short amount of time. But what I really want to do now is hear from you all. I would love to continue the conversation either with questions. Um, you guys can mute and unmute. Hop on your camera if you'd like to. You can drop it into the chat if that's more comfortable for you. But I really want to hear a little bit about what you're doing, what you found to be effective, because you may have some ideas that I haven't considered and somebody else uh, who's on this call could really benefit from hearing. All right. So I have a bit of a double-edged sword. Breathe Salt Therapy is brand new. So it is myself and my daughter. We're struggling with being a mom, daughter, boss employee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You are not alone in that, Lisa. My husband and I are business partners. And I think many people in all of the industries, um, you know, in the wellness community are in those sorts of partnerships. Um, what really, really helps, and especially if you're hiring friends, if you're hiring anybody that you know, no matter what the case is, clear documentation on roles and responsibilities. Um, my husband and I are very, very different. Our employees know that we're very different. How we operate, how we work, how we think, what we see, what matters to us, those are all very different things. And so we're, we try to be very intentional with each other about not step, stepping on each other's toes, but we also communicate that to our team and let our team know, here are the things that are important to me. Here are the things I'm going to see and I'm going to say something about. Here are the things that are important to him and that he's going to say something about. But with that, we're also really clear about who to go to with issues, who, especially if there's like multiple bosses, you know, that double authority um, sort of thing. Um, who's responsible for uh, timekeeping issues or if you have payroll issues, all of that sort of stuff to try to be super clear about those roles and responsibilities. And if it is a really close family member, especially a parent child relationship or a spousal relationship, that is such a crucial, crucial piece because it can impact your relationship in a very, very big way, either positively or negatively and understanding how you each work having those really hard conversations. Um, you know, I am very detail oriented at the center. If I'm there, I'm noticing every little thing, but I also realize that I am not every person who comes in the door. And so the fact that I see something, I saw that splatter of salt on the back wall where nobody ever walks. I have to check myself and say, you know what, that, that's not a big deal. I just go over and wipe it off, but it, I don't need to go you know, telling my husband or my entire team, like, hey, we've got to do a better job of this. Now, if you're starting to see trends of things, that's where you can come together and have a conversation. If I've noticed that, you know, in most cases, this is the behavior I'm seeing and this is the impact that it has. Um, and what can we do to resolve this? If you're coming at things with, you're not doing it the way I told you to, that creates a power struggle. And so having, you know, those those conversations in a very calm manner, typically not when you're in the middle of it. If you feel like you need to pick up the phone and call somebody and chew them out because of something that's happened, that's probably not the best idea. Let yourself calm down, 
step away from the situation and then address it later. Um, because most of the time things aren't as big a deal as what we try to make them in our own heads. So at least it does that help at all, like finding that, get really clear on who does what. Um, and just to kind of solidify that example a little more, my husband and I dif have different titles. Um, he is the uh, director of operations. I am the director of strategy. And within that, we each have different roles and responsibilities. He is responsible for float tank maintenance. He is responsible for making sure that we have all of the supplies that we need in order to keep everything running. And that might be he checks it and lets me know because I typically do all of the ordering. And so he needs to be checking on those things on a regular basis. I'm watching the numbers and the reports. I'm looking at, um, you know, does our retail display work in its current format? What do I need to change? Do I need to refresh something specific in that? Um, how are our appointments looking? Are we seeing a good mix? Are we still getting a lot of new time or first timers? Do we need to, you know, do some kind of a marketing effort to get new people in or what's going on with our members? Are they not coming in? And so I'm always looking at all the data and trying to figure out like what we need to do based on that, where he is typically there. He's taking care of customer service issues. He's making the decision about, you know, when to comp sessions, when not to those sorts of things. So getting really crystal clear on who does what can really help, help on that relationship issue. So Kim, will yes. you stop your screen share so we can see you better, first of yes. all? Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and Gina's question is about managing um, employees when you're in a team environment. So when people mm -hmm. are working different shifts and when you try to have a monthly meeting, but not everyone's available to come to it, how do you work around those schedules? Yep. There's a couple of different ways. And that's such a challenge. It's so important to get your team together, but it's also just as important to get your team together for specific reasons and for like casual reasons together. So you can do maybe a quarterly um, format where everyone is required to attend some way. And that might be in person at the center. Maybe it's jumping on a Zoom call. Maybe, you know, they can attend that virtually. Um, and then also make some time for people who want to show up and be together and enjoy some time just showing up as a human together. Um, it is really, really hard to get everybody's schedules to align. That's part of the reason you have multiple employees is because we can't, um, we can't all be everywhere at once or, or at the same time. So find ways to communicate and keep that sense of team but also to be able to communicate really important things. Um, that can look like a dry erase board in the back room where everybody sees the notes. That can look like using a communication log in Helm or whatever system that you're using. It could be you know, emails, it could be using Slack. It could, there are so many different communication tools, but you wanna make sure that whatever it is, that everyone has easy access to it and that it's really clear on what the expectation is. If you are emailing everyone on their personal email addresses, you might also be required to pay them for the time that they're uh, reading those emails. So I would recommend being cautious about, you know, that as much as you can. If it is a meeting, like you need to be paying them for that. Um, if it's, hey, let's go bowling, let's go play whirly ball, um, whatever that is. Let them know if it's going to be paid time. If it's not, if it if they're getting paid to be there, they're probably more likely to show up. Um, but if it's just a, you know what, no stress. We just want to see you guys come and hang out with us if you can. Um, that's also an option. Are you saying we get paid to, to play whirly ball? That sounds great. Uh, oh. you know. Looks like we've got another question here from Alicia. Um, she says that her staffs love, love trades and barters with other businesses, the ability to use their monthly friend and family floats. Um, oh, this is just a, this is not a question. This is just a statement. Yes. <laughs> so they do trades with yoga studios, um, chiropractors, acupuncturists, um, and then they just limit their, their employees floats, um, to slow times, which makes sense. Yep. I love it. And we do something similar once a month. We give our employees um, buddy passes. 
and, you know, encourage them to give those out to people. Um, and to, they, it's totally up to them, however they want to use that. They can give it to their best friend. They can give it to their mom. They can give it to their spouse. They can give it to their server when they got to eat. It doesn't matter what they want to do with it. It's totally fine. Um, and in return, sometimes we do partner with other businesses. Um, and, you know, an example that we did recently, we had a membership drive and we worked with local businesses to exchange gift certificates. And I had a uh, prize wheel that everybody who signed up for a membership got to spin the wheel. And when it was all over, we had a lot of prizes and not all of them were awarded to our guests. And so I had those extra gift certificates that I can give to my employees, um, you know, and just have that extra little perk. So I gave the business a gift certificate. They gave me one. And I can use that for both purposes for, you know, my, my uh, team and for my guests. That's so fun. I've never seen like so many, I know I'm reading the chat too. I've never seen so many bartering, like in other industries that I've worked with. Like mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've worked in restaurants and we've traded like meals with other restaurants, but the extent of like float bartering, I just feel like it shows how much of givers, how generous pe floaty people are. And, I remember here at, at Float On, we had to deal with um, like a bakery where we could just mm -hmm. go get a loaf of bread for free. And, and we traded them for floats. And, and that was awesome. They don't do it anymore because we ate a lot more bread than they had time for floating. But um, <laughs> a lot of bread. <laughs> and so we, we like bread here. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was really cool to to just get to know, you know, your local companies. And um, mm -hmm. it was fun. Yeah. So yeah, Lisa said that you sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks over there. Um, but hopefully that's uh, just maybe she can just refresh and we yeah. won't have any other issues there. I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna give us a little song? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Anybody else have any um cool little things that they do to help keep their employees um thriving? Or questions for Kim? And I really do think, I mean, the, the majority of it is just treating people like the meaningful humans that they are um, and, and recognizing each person brings something really unique and really different. And um, you, you can attract the right folks. You know, we are very slow to hire. Um, and, you know, there's the, the saying of being slow to hire and fast to fire. Um, I, I try really hard to make sure that the first part goes so well, we don't have to go to the second part. But I also want to remind everybody that this is not a forever job. And if you're expecting people to stay around for three or four or 10 years, you might need to adjust your expectations a little bit. Um, it is wonderful if they do stay that long. But even in the corporate world with some really high paying jobs, nobody really stays put that long anymore. Um, even as an owner, you have to be honest with yourself and recognize when you're starting to feel burnout. And the same is true for employees. No matter how much we love it, it is still work. And we have to recognize and be super honest with the fact that work can make us tired and work can burn us out. And that's one of the reasons it's so important to check in with people and whether you're doing it with like formal performance reviews or not checking in with people to say like, how are you feeling? How's it going? Would you like to take on more responsibility? Some people do. Some people are also perfectly happy, never taking on more responsibility. In fact, they might want to give up some things. So check in with people and just see how they're feeling on things. Awesome. We do have another question in the chat from <laughs> Gina. Um, sounds like they have an employee who asks a lot of questions, but feels like things need to be asked in front of the entire team. And sometimes the questions are a little bit repetitive. Um, mm -hmm. Any advice on that? Yeah. So if it is repetitive, then that could be a matter of reminding them where to find the answers. It could be, you know, hey, we talked about that last week and it's documented here if you ever need to look it up again. Um, kind of helping to remind them of where to go for those answers. And if the answer isn't documented somewhere, that could be a really good indicator that it needs to be. Um, as far as asking in front of everyone, um, I think it really just depends on the issue. You know, there are some things that will impact everybody and some things that don't. So I, I think if it's a case where, um, and I'm generally in favor of full transparency where possible, 
Um, but there are, of course, certain things that may not impact the whole team, or maybe it's something really specific for one individual, and that does need to be a private conversation. And so that would be like pulling that person aside and saying, hey, I've noticed you've been asking this type of question a lot lately. Um, can you share a little bit about, you know, what is driving that? Or um, do you feel like the whole team needs to be involved in that conversation? You know, and just really asking questions, trying to understand where they're coming from. They could just be like, oh, this is the only time I ever see you. So it's the only time I have. And that's why I'm asking you right now. Good points. I really like that you said it should be documented somewhere. I know, um, like having, I don't know if it's an employee handbook or like a procedures book technically, but having a place where somebody knows that they can go to look up any question that they might have is huge. Like it's a really important part of mm -hmm. empowering your employees to, to answer their own questions. Exactly. Yes. And if you don't have that, you know, one of the things that we've done um, as we have new employees coming in is I pay attention to what questions they're asking me and I go back and update the, the employee manual I, or the employee handbook. I doc, or update our policies and procedures based on those questions. And then I also make sure to let them know, hey, thank you for asking that question. I added it here. Um, and that way they know that they can go back and find you know, that information later and that I'm paying attention and I do care what they're asking about. You know, I had a position in the past where my employer um, actively encouraged me to update things that were mm -hmm. out of date on our mm -hmm. procedures document. And that really helped me feel like not only to think more in depth about how I was doing things in order to write it down and to, to see where things could be tweaked a little bit to make them better, but it just mm -hmm. made, me, made me feel really important and not just like an employee, but made me feel like I was like yeah. actively a member of the team, you know? It's funny you say that because that's actually how I got a promotion at one point in one of my roles was because I would notice like, oh, we don't have a documented policy on this. And I would bring it up to my leadership team and say, what should we do? And they're like, you know what? You should update this. And then I took over that particular piece of the business. And the next thing you know, like it grew into a whole new role for me. We created this whole new um, division and it turned into like a literal career. <laughs> that's how I got started in the training world, you know? <laughs> Amazing. We should all just start writing down everything we do. And then that's how you get a promotion. That's it. Unless you're already your own boss, then <laughs> you kind of can't get any, any higher there, you guys. Sorry about right. that. Yep. <laughs> but maybe you can um, in, enhance your procedures that you're already doing. <laughs> right. I have uh, this little box. It was a company called OC Tanner. Um, and it's really fun. I don't know. Like I've used a bunch of these and I've used this in you know the past world. And then I'll, I'll be bringing on some more um for our employees, but it's basically these tiny little cards. They're just greeting cards. And this one says, congrats. And then it's got a little like thing where you can fill out the to and from inside. And there's little buttons. Like this one's one of my favorites. Um, it says idea machine. And it's just a really fun way. Like if somebody comes up with a great idea or if they're consistently coming up with free, uh, great ideas, like you can put this together and it came with little envelopes. And there's a whole bunch of other just blank cards and just dropping a little card, leaving it on the desk for somebody to pick up whenever they do like something. And it doesn't have to be huge at all. It can just be like changing where you put the towels or how you hang the towels or whatever it is. Just those little bitty things that you feel like have made an impact. Give them some kind of recommend or rec recognition for that. And, you know, having little thank you cards on hand or fun little gifts or a $5 gift card to a local coffee shop. Um, you know, just those little bitty things can often mean the world to somebody. Awesome. Well, if you all think of anything else, please like keep that conversation going. You're welcome to, you know, drop comments into the Facebook uh, event. You can, of course, we all have the Flip Collective and it's uh, amazing to see some ideas and conversations come to life in there too. So um, and keep it going. If if y'all have any thoughts on another webinar that you'd like us to share, what kind of topics you'd like to talk about, um, we will be working on our technical issues and resolving those before we do this again. Um, but yeah, let us know. Awesome. Thank you all so much for joining us.